Hey there, Golden Bear family. Today we cover module 2.5, the middle colonies. And a couple of items for us to kind of be mindful of is this is when the kings of England were kind of distributing out properties to their most faithful and most loyal. And uh, since most of the northern colonies were taken and Netherlands were still in New York at the time and the south was already divided up, uh, what was left in the middle was given to those who, who kind of showed the greatest favoritism to the king, whether it be Charles or James during this time period. Some targets that we're going to be looking at is, is definitely environment, how it continues to shape and form what's happening in the colonies along the Atlantic seaboard. We see how uh, numerous types of people groups are coming into the middle colonies. And we find how uh, the middle colonies, namely Pennsylvania, uh, changed economically along with the social diversity during this time period. Some key themes that you need to be mindful of is that um, there's trade taking place and New York City becomes the hub and has continued to remain to be that hub, uh, you know, namely why the Twin Towers was taken down because it was the banking center, epicenter of the globe uh, then and still continues to be. But uh, what, what allowed that to happen we'll discuss. And then also the religious and ethnic tolerance of Pennsylvania that drew thousands upon thousands of immigrants there to come and share their story and to kind of live and coexist rather peacefully, mind you. I would encourage you to go back and look for this graphic organizer that I provided for you. You should have been using this when we've been discussed in the New England colonies. Today we're on the middle colonies. And uh, the last one we talked about the southern uh, colonies uh, and the Chesapeake Bay. I would put Chesapeake and the southern colonies uh, together in that mindset. So pressing forward, uh, part one of this talked about New York and New Jersey. Well, with the Glorious Revolution taking place in Great Europe and the Civil War creating all sorts of havoc over there, there was uh, this, this uh, new movement of people taking place in New York City. With uh, so much taking on place in Europe, it allowed some shaking and baking, if you will, of taking away, the, uh, kicking out the, de the Dutch who were there in, in, New, in New Netherlands, it was called at the time, and basically kind of reinstituting the English in power there. And when William and Mary took over, remember from last lecture, uh, they gave back powers to the colonists that James II had taken away and appointed a governor that really kind of was um, hmm, trying to regain control. But in this absence during this glorious revolution, there was an interesting thing that took place. There was this man named... Um, Oh, I think it's Jacob Leesler. I can't think of his first name right now, but uh, Jacob Leesler uh, was much like a, a, a Nathaniel Bacon, is that he came from German ancestry and he was very, very frustrated with how all of the laws and the land titles and, and the wealth was, was collected in the hands of a few people. And so he took it upon himself to formulate a few band uh, wagon the people and they joined together as misfit ragamuffins if you will and they began a class revolt denouncing these high costs denouncing these low uh, fi uh, wages but also these unfair taxes and unfair land titles and so this revolution took steam to where eventually he found himself booting out the magistrates that were in power places him placing himself and other cronies in power and uh, began changing the laws. And in fact, when people of uh, the wealth would come to him and say, this person has to pay this uh, rent and this person has to pay that rent, he'd say, oh, sorry, we're not listening to you right now uh, because we're going to take care of the common man. A very great story, interesting story that sadly didn't take any traction. Why? Because when William and Mary came back, they essentially kind of reinstituted and had now greater focus to put in to quell this man. And they eventually arrested him and sent him off packing. And if I'm not mistaken, maybe even executed him. Oh, there it says, executed for this. What the sad part of this is class issues persisted. And we're going to see this is going to be a constant uh, a strand or th a thread as we progress into... Uh, into the colonial history and into beyond that, especially as we uh, veer into the Industrial Revolution uh, post-Christmas season. Uh, I'm going to skip this because this is what I'll be covering with students who are taking the AP exam. Um, I would love to bring to your attention this growing inequality in this chart here. It's important that, you know, for those of you who are taking the AP exam, but just in general, 
that you've come across these during the state testing that sometimes charts will be given to you and it's your job to determine what's taking place here. And so in this instance, you can begin seeing that it starts on the left-hand side in 1690 on the lower axis and it moves its way to 1775. And during that time, you see the purple band increasing, basically meaning that the wealthier people are getting richer and richer and richer and the green band of poor people, uh, they're getting poorer, poorer, poorer. Why is that? Because the tax laws and the title laws and, and, and the wealth was captured in too small of hands and creating this grower, growing inequality that uh, Leisler was trying to address during this time. So here's some good historical evidence to break out. Uh, then during in this time, we also need to recognize that the, the many Dutch landholding families, you would think they would flee and leave, but they're like, no, we helped establish this area uh, in, in, in the um, Hudson River Valley. Uh, we don't need to leave. And the English were like, we're not expecting you to leave. Stay here and do business with us. And so this is what helped facilitate New York becoming a power broker place, but also an economic financial institution. And what you need to recognize is that in New York City, we begin seeing a diverse population beginning to form where it still to this day exists. In fact, at the very bottom of the screen, I'll talk more about this for the students who come back for the AP coaching, if you will, but this word polyglot essentially means that there's numerous different people groups living in one small area or designated neighborhoods. So here on the screen, you can see there's upper class living amongst the middle class and all of them doing different types of jobs. And they're like, they have no problem with that. But what is the most unique aspect of it is that there were almost 14% of the population were enslaved people groups. That's not something that is often spoken of and is a misconception that only the slaves were down south. You can't say that slaves were only down south when 14% of, of New York City is comprised of slave laborers. Yes, working at the docks. Yes, doing manual labor and those things. But for the most part, History textbooks have forgotten the fact that that is there. What you need to keep an eye on is that idea of that word there on the screen, inequality. It is happening, it has started, and we will see that as a continuity uh, of American history uh, as we trace this course all the way to today, where we're still having um, presidents as you, you know, or people running for president uh, that are arguing for this inequality and are finding a way to uh, minimize that uh, at this point. Going on to the next key thing is, is good old Penn. Um, William Penn, a, a man of deep convictions, a man who um, was willing to take uh, deep prejudices and, and almost ideas of, of deep-rooted hatred toward him simply because he wanted to be a, he wanted to be a man of peace. And so he took his, his religious affiliations and blended them into his political and economic uh, world. This is what William Winthrop, uh, not John Winthrop, had talked about in terms of the city upon a hill where how can you take your private thought life and connect it to your daily life? And he was challenging England to do that. Here you have a man that's trying to do the same thing every day. And guess what? They spoke out against him. And, and as a Quaker, he was quickly dismissed by his peer group and, and basically uh, kind of excommunicated from society. Well, because he was friends with King Charles II, or King Charles II had some sense of compassion for him, he, he granted him a large chunk of land, which is modern day, I think, New Hampshire and Pennsylvania, to where he has a place to where his Quakers can go. What made the Quakers unique, and this is some part that you need to be aware of, is that they were inclusive. Remember, not every group was like that. The Jamestown people, you can't call them inclusive. You can't talk about the New Englanders being inclusive. You can't talk about the Chesapeake Bay being new, uh, that way. You can't talk about the South Carolinas and the plantation being inclusive, especially towards Native Americans on almost all of those fronts. But here you have the Quakers moving in and making and establishing relationships with them that, that kind of carries through for the most part across the Pennsylvania uh, countryside. The other thing that made them unique is religious freedoms for all, and this is what caused all sorts of immigrants to come in um, from Scotland to from Germany, from northern parts of Russia, uh, and, and what we would call Prussia, I guess in that time period, would be coming to experience a sense of community, even though they had Christ 
uh, they, they, they celebrated him differently. And then last thing is that property owning men could vote and hold office. Didn't matter the size of the property. It mattered if you even owned property. And this is a unique thing. So they're taking away the power from the elitist power brokers that were in the South Carolina, for instance, that had huge plantations. No, if you own land, you had an opportunity to vote. And that was very appealing if you were an indentured servant, etc. if you came over under this Redeemer's thing that we'll talk about soon, that you get land, you now automatically have a part of American uh, history and a part of America to vote. That was a unique attribute. Uh, talking about this slide here, Blue, I want to show you, just looking at this map, and if you take the AP you know, thing after this with me for, for coaching. I'll talk more about the question there. But looking at this map, you can begin seeing the black dots representing where the, the you know, the colonial uh, people are coming from immigrants next to the, tri the triangles there of the Native Americans. In some instances, look, they're kind of living close to one another and, and having neighborhoods that are together. And this is a unique thing that we'll talk to us for, that we will talk further about how there for the initial first few years in Pennsylvania that on the frontier the settlers got along well with the Native Americans and in fact trade with them openly for land uh, and paid them for it or or had some sort of agreements with them. This was not the case in many of the other places. I'll be skipping this and doing this for my AP type seminar. Now, uh, talking about expansion and eventually conflict emerging into Pennsylvania, well, Penn, you know, William Penn dies and control over the colony just continued to kind of wither, not knowing uh, where it was going, how it was going to go, and what was taking place. And during the same time, with huge populations emerging, because, you know, the message was there was land all over uh, available for, for them to take or to purchase, um, more and more were showing up. Well, because more and more were showing up, uh, this created a major glut of workers and not enough jobs out there. And and what 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 is this good for? Well, it's good for the wealthy people because that means they're paying the workers very less or much less. But it created a problem that we're going to talk about with the unemployment. Who were these people? Well, they were called the Redemptioners. And this is not unlike uh, the indentured servants that were brought over uh, at the early part of, of the Chesapeake Bay and into New England colonies. Uh, this is just kind of a different name, same idea, but these redemptioners were, were paid by a, a, an owner, and, and in order for them to redeem their freedom, they had to work so many years, and then they were sent off to the frontier to go find land. And, and this seemed to be a very good system, especially for people coming in, not from England now, but from different parts of Europe where these redeemers would go and pursue them. Well, as more and more keep kept arriving and settling, this began creating more of a collision and collision point for the land that was limited and finite. And what was the result of this is, sadly, um, it, it went from being kind of friendly relationships with the Native Americans to where now um, William Penn is gone, some shady dealings were, could take place with some of these different towns, and what they found is they come up with kind of allegedly fake treaties that were created under William Penn and other chiefs and they would present it to them and 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 they would go the Native Americans would go well okay I guess if this was the treaty under William Penn we respected him for what he did for us we'll have to honor this treaty and so what the walking purchase treaty was basically uh, the the person holding that paper got to walk for a, a full day sometimes a full day and a half and where that one person can cover in a full day was the land that they got to keep and so this is a first example of many that will take place as part of American history where broken treaties between different tribes will be taking shape uh, summarize just to remind yourself that you should have heard me talk about New York City and how that became an epicenter of trade and and how that created different groups of people that were coming into that area and that we talked about the religious tolerance that was taking place in Pennsylvania at the time let's uh, I also want to bring to your attention oh this is what I'm going to do with my uh, other classes all right let's talk about uh, module 2.6 and um, the Atlantic economy that is is about to, to emerge for you I hope you're doing good so far a couple of targets that you need to be mindful of this is um, this is the, called the transatlantic trade system I'm going to give you another word here in another slide but this is an important piece as to what helps trigger uh, the reason why we have the colonies in the first place and then the reason that will hope that will explain perhaps why uh, the need for 
of various slaves uh, coming in soon. That it also so it brings tremendous change to our economy. It brings tremendous change to our society. And this idea of mercantilist practices, I'm going to try and do my best to do some explaining on. Okay. Uh, the thing that we need to recognize, because the Atlantic economy system, it is making the American Atlantic seaboard very complex. And it's deepening um, the attempts by Europe to capitalize on the growth that is taking place there. So this here is what I like to call commercial networks. Uh, you know, you young folk are used to hearing about networks, network, networks. Um, you know, it started with Facebook and the social networking idea. Um, networks came out even before that where you were combining different computer systems to talk. You hear of ecosystems like in the Apple world and how they work together. This is kind of no different that there were European nations that had some of them were closed ecosystems or closed networks where they only traded with certain African tribes and then those African tribes might only trade with certain, you know, Europeans, etc. And so you can see there is this triangular type trade that can be taking place. And um, there's a video that I might, you know, I'll, I'll point out to you to watch on your own that you can link on the PowerPoint that will kind of convey kind of some of these things, uh, the importance of them when we get to the next subject and talking about slavery. But you can see here some things. I want to point out something to you just for a second. If you look in the left-hand corner, you know, it uh, looks like some of this trade is heading to the West East Indies there, you know, where Cuba and the Bahamas are. And my question to you is, where in the world would most of the contentious battles for supremacy and trade be taking place? Is it taking place in Africa? Is it taking place in Portugal? Is it taking place in England? Is it in the New World? And, and you think, wow, all those people are going to the New World. Maybe that's the most contentious place. No, reality is the most contended place is dealing with Jack Sparrow and the pirates. All they're down in the Caribbean. Why? Because sugar has four forms of which it can make some money, uh, whether it be white sugar, brown sugar, molasses, or even into rum. That's a heck of a lot more than what tobacco can bring, and, and so hence uh, the, 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 the level of piracy and competition trade was huge in that area down there. There's a video here on mercantilism that I would encourage you to go back and watch. It's about two minutes, and, and, and it's going to share with you real briefly as to the aspect of mercantilism, but basically the idea of mercantilism is, is England and those three major European powers there of Spain and France basically want to control and dominate the entire economies across the globe. And what they want to do is they want to collect as much gold and silver as they possibly can. And in, and, and in place of that, they want to be able to create things to trade outward uh, from those other countries. And so if they can collect as much gold and silver and at the same time also find other natural resources to bring, bring in, whether it's timber from uh, the Americas or whether it's... Uh, coffee from South Mesoamerica, um, they, they, they want to make sure that they can control all of those aspects. Why? This gives them the power and this allows them then to control how those raw materials can be turned into manufactured goods, thus in turn bringing them greater amount of money. Why and how is this made possible? Well, um, the Spain and, and, and France uh, have always been buddy and chummy. Uh, it goes back, you know, 100 plus years uh, before uh, when they were uh, still part of the same empire. And so that's, I don't know if it's 100 years, but close to that. And, and with that, that, they've always been, those two seem to be tag teaming against uh, whatever England was doing. And so uh, both, all three are kind of trying to find ways how to, how to make their um, mercantilistic systems keep growing. Spain's... Um, Gold and silver mines are running out, and they're looking for new means to, to make wealth. England is trying to rediscover or embark on new ways to catch up to where those other two had left off. And so it's a very interesting thing that both have adopted. But one thing that I need you to recognize what the British do, the English do, they pass this thing called the Navigation Acts. And this is going to be kind of the first step where England begins to use the laws to gain the upper edge for not only themselves in England over what's taking place in the colonies, but also for a global sense. And essentially what it meant is 
all colonial goods had to pass through British ports in England, or wherever, which part it would be, doesn't matter if it's Manchester or whatnot, um, but it had to pass through a port there to where taxes could be paid there, and then it had to be shipped anywhere else it had to go for its final stop. And so this created a power, but it also created a, a nice profit for them, and then it also limited what things in the colonies could be made and sold, because if England says no, then it didn't have a place to go. Well, being typical of the colonists, um, they have um, a great opportunity to capture this, at one time, purely dominated London-owned thing where they owned most of the boats. It wasn't before long that we begin seeing the British giving up the rights to buy these boats because they get out fox and out maneuvered by some of the American colonists. Here is a picture I'm going to talk more about in my students that take uh, the AP stuff a little bit later on with me. I'm going to do that with them as well. So I want to talk to you about, so soon the North American merchants begin to recognize if we're ever going to make money, we have to find ways to buy boats to get them to be part of those that are heading over to, to London. And soon they do and we begin seeing the scales tipping. And the navigation acts that were meant to benefit those living in England and owning the ships in England and having the merchant stuff in England has now tipped back to the colonists because now the colonists control a uh, majority of the shipping lines. And that's a unique thing that, that happens. And what does this do? It allows America seaports to become very, very large, growing very rapidly and, it, and, and putting in the most latest advanced um, ideas and mindsets. It also created this idea of this consumer revolution where the wealthy of wealthy started showing off their wealth and what they were building and creating and, and kind of rivaling what they were finding in Europe during the time. And this is where you start seeing fine china and wallpaper and other things in the homes like Boylston Street, you can go to Boston and in his house you can go in and visit. I mean wallpaper that was hand made and created in Spain somewhere is hanging on his walls there today. It's kind of some cool stuff, but it was just basically a big display of wealth. I'll be talking about that in my after class thing there. And so, so you know, with all these immigrants have coming over, the mercantilism system creating this trade, um, we begin seeing sadly that this disparity of wealth is taking its toll uh, not only out in the rural parts of Pennsylvania, it's now taking its toll to the people living in the city. And, you know, they thought, well, there's no jobs in the, in the rural parts. What if we go into the city and see these transient workers are finding that they don't have a place to work either. And, and soon, uh, New England, although they're supposed to be the city upon a hill, begins kind of doing these warnings to say, if you don't move on, we might boot you out or permanently, you know, lock you up. Um, but, and typically, they didn't do much to them, if not. But... Uh, there were some regions that actually became overseers of the poor and really tried to work and help with them living up to their Christian charity and duty uh, for those up there in the New England colonies. To summarize again, the Atlantic economy under its idea of mercantilism created this very complex network that the British attempted to control simply by the navigation acts, but the colonists being ever shrewd found a way to work around that and and bought into that and then eventually started making a lot more money than what England had anticipated. And that's going to set us up for an interesting thing as we gear up for the road to the revolution. So that's it this morning. And let me pause my reading.